A new rotation in standard means we're going to get 10 new starter decks added to our accounts, which you should have already. So let's go through what's included in these decks, which cards are the most important for your collection, and maybe which one of these decks seems to be the best at the moment, especially if you're going to be playing in the starter deck duel format. Welcome back to the channel. We're going to go through these 10 new starter decks in a small amount of detail. I'm not going to spend ages on each one because you can have a look at them yourself and go through it in detail. I'm going to talk about basically the strategies that you'll have for each of these decks and the best cards in there. And then after that, we're going to go through which ones seem to be the most popular and the most effective in starter deck duels, which are really important, especially if you're a new player. So first of all, we have the Ancient Discovery deck, the red and white deck that is based around mostly the Discover mechanic. We have Atali's Favor, we have Geological Appraiser, which are really good. We've even got the Curator of Sun's Creation to double Discover triggers once per turn. And we've got some other cards that also do the same. Daring Discovery, Discovers 4. Yet the Mother Load is a really fun card to do. It can be a fun card to do, which Discovers 10. We've also got lands, so the hidden courtyard and the hidden volcano that also discover. So that's the basic idea of this deck. You want to try and get out as much value as possible, as quickly as possible. And discovering basically lets you play extra things for free. The problem with this deck is there isn't really that much that's great that you can discover. And there are some cards that don't really work with this, like the Guardian of the Great Door. You can discover this. You can't play it unless you're going to tap four other artifacts, creatures, or lands. So it's still not really playing it for free. Also, connecting the dots is kind of a waste. It's not a very good card at all. And Attentive Sunscribe is the only early creature you're going to be able to play, and it isn't that good. Okay, but it's not amazing. The best strategy you can have with this is try and get out as much as possible with Tinker's Tote, making some extra 1-1s, one maybe with Anim Pakal, making some gnome creatures. And War Leader's Call to make them more stronger and ping for some damage. And maybe attack with On The Job, giving everything plus two, plus one for a final attack. Maybe do enough damage. And if you're lucky enough to draw your Aurelia when you have a few creatures out, you're probably going to get a bit of damage through that way. And also Bone Horde Dracosaur, if your opponent can't remove this, you can pretty much win the game with this. When I was doing some test games with this in the midweek magic event, I won three games in a row with this deck and it felt like it was really good. But the way it's made is really not that good, especially compared to the other ones. So this is not the best one by far. That doesn't mean it's impossible to win with. It's just, uh, yeah, not quite as well made as the other ones. But at the very least, you're getting some value in your account by having a War Leader's Call if you didn't have one already, and in Pakal. Aurelia, Bonehorde, Dracosaur, they're all really good cards. Uh, hit the Mother Load, doesn't get used very much, but can be used, I guess, in some fun decks. And then you also get four Deserts, the two color Deserts, and one Inspiring Vantage. If you don't have those already, those get added to your account when you've got the starter decks. If you already had some, then you don't get extra copies. You only get enough just to fill out this particular deck. So let me know what you think of this one in the comments. The next one we have is Crack the Case, the blue and white detective um, themed deck. Again, this isn't a very, very well built deck. It's not a very effective deck, but when you're playing starter deck duels, you're playing against other starter decks, so none of them are that optimized. So you're not that far behind based on the fact it isn't optimized. But you have some good cards here. We've got Novice Inspector. When you have Croft's Eidetic Memory out, you can start adding plus one counters onto things. If you have a good number of detectives out, then Private Eye can help boost them all. We also have um, Ezrim is the best card in the deck. So you have five mana, five, five flyer, which investigates twice when it enters. But then you can pay one to sacrifice an artifact to give Ezrim Vigilance, Lifelink, or Hexproof. So you can basically make this a very, very big threat in the air that can't be killed with normal kill spells, but obviously can be taken out by sweepers and by damage because it's not indestructible. So as long as you have clue tokens that you've made with Ezrim, or maybe Novice Inspector, or you have some of these other equipments out, you're always going to have an artifact you can sacrifice to it, and Ezrim is pretty powerful. The other decent cards you get in the deck are the Steam Core Scholar, which is a pretty decent flying threat, which helps draw extra cards, and fix your hand, maybe if you're drawing too much land or not enough land. But Alquist Prof as well, who can also draw lots of cards and gain life if you have lots of clue tokens. 
And it's not the best strategy normally, but we have Agency Outfitter, six mana, four, three, flyer. When it enters, you can search for the magnifying glass and the thinking cap, so you can basically help boost your detectives as well. It's not as good as Ezrim, but it's, you know, it can be good. And this deck does also include no witnesses, which isn't the best sweeper, because whichever player controls the most creatures gets to investigate, and you destroy all creatures. So you're kind of, you kind of want to be the person with the most creatures to get the extra value out of investigating, but you're not going to be casting this unless you have, unless you're behind on board. So I guess it depends what you have. If you have three novice inspectors and your opponent has two massive dinosaurs, then you are getting lots of value out of this. So it can come in handy if you if you have a lot of value built up with these um, clue tokens. You then reset the board and then win on card advantage. So it can happen with this. You also do get the four deserts in the white and blue, and you also get a surveil land from um, Carl of Merlin, which is not too bad. So if you don't have those, they are added to your collection. You do also have officious interrogation, which works pretty well when you and your opponent both have lots of creatures, so you get to investigate lots of times, but it probably doesn't come up too often. But anyway, let me know what you think of the Detectives deck in the comments. Then we have the green and blue Simic Ramp deck. We have lots of benefit you can get from lands and you have ways to explore. So for instance, we have Bristly Bill to add plus one counters on your creatures when lands enter. We have cards like Jade Light Spelunker, which can explore X times when it enters. Sentinel of the Nameless City, another great card that creates map tokens, so you get to explore. The Deep Fathom Echo can give you lots of value in this deck because at the beginning of combat on your turn, it gets to explore every turn, and it can then become a copy of another creature. And some other creatures are really good things to copy, like maybe a Colossal Rattle Worm that becomes a 6 5 trample. And with all the exploring it can do, you can also have extra plus one counters added onto it as well. The basic strategy for this deck is to get lands out as quickly as possible. Maybe things like the Beanstalk Worm Adventure can help you play additional lands on your turn. And when you do get seven lands out, you have Case of the Locked Hot House, which can play lands and creatures and enchantments off the top of your deck. And you get to play an additional land on each of your turns anyway, so it helps you get lots of card advantage when you get to that point of the game. And then you can probably win with Bonnie Paul Clearcutter. It's a six mana, six five reach, which creates the legendary Oct, who has power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control. So in theory, you can get lots of lands out pretty quickly and make this very big. And then when you attack with any creature, Bonnie Paul can draw a card and then you can put a land from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield, which obviously makes the Ox bigger as well. But it can also boost other creatures like the Outcaster Greenblade, who has um, power and toughness gets boosted with the number of deserts you control. And you can also get lands out by surprise with things like Colossal Rattle Worm. If it's in the graveyard, you can pay two, exile it from your graveyard, search for a desert card, and put it straight onto the battlefield tap. So if your opponent's blocking the Ox and they think they're going to beat it, you might be able to get an extra land out. Two mana um, combat trick, essentially, to make it bigger. Or same thing with the Green Blade. Got four deserts in here, and we've also got the one Surveil Land from Call of Mana as well. So this deck is a bit better than the other ones. You just have to survive the early game, and then with things like Case of a Locked Hot House, you should be able to get a lot of advantage. Let me know what you think of this one in the comments. The next one we have is the green and red dinosaur deck. Now, I have a really good green and red dinosaur deck that I like to play in standard. Obviously, it has some of these cards, but this has a lot of other stuff that you probably wouldn't include in a dinosaur deck. But one thing this deck does seem to be missing is anything that really ramps. We do have two copies of In the Presence of Ages that can put a creature or land into your hand. And we do have two copies of They Went This Way, which can put a basic land onto the battlefield tapped and help you investigate, which isn't terrible. But still, it feels very slow. And it really means that we're not going to be able to cast things like Golta until your hand is pretty much empty anyway. So you're not going to get a huge amount of value of putting extra creature cards on the battlefield, but an 8 mana 12 12 trample isn't bad by itself anyway. The best cards we have in the deck would be uh, It's Quint, which can enter and you can pay two to make a dinosaur fight one of your opponent's creatures. If you have something like a Pugnacious Hammer Skull out, that's going to do six damage, which is not bad. The Armored Kin Caller can keep you alive a bit longer by gaining three life when it enters, 
which is kind of useful. The Hulking Raptor is actually another way of ramping, but there's only one of them in the deck, so you're not going to find it every game. But 5 3 Ward 2 that adds two green mana at the beginning of your uh, first main phase is not bad either. And then we've also got the Trumpeting Carnosaur, which is a really useful, really good card. The Earthshaker Dreadmore, if you still have lots of creatures out, can draw you lots of cards, which is really useful. And then, yes, if you can get Galter down, especially if you have lots of other creatures in your hand at the same time, then you're probably going to win by that point. We've also got the four um, deserts again and the one surveil land. So if you didn't have those already, they've also been added to your collection. So it's not the best dinosaur deck ever, but it's not too bad either. Probably about average for these uh, starter decks. But let me know what you think of this one. Next, we have the fairy pranks deck. That's the black and blue deck, which has some really good controlling cards in there with a fairy theme as well. So we have things like the sleep curse fairy that are really good to get down at the beginning. We have great counter spells like Three Steps Ahead, which can counter and create copies, and it can um, draw cards and help fix your hand as well. Decent removal with things like Fairy Fencing, Hard Advantage with Deduce, Spell Stutter is a decent um, counter spell when you have a few fairies out. It can make the opponent pay quite a lot to be able to um, still resolve their spells. You can also get lots of value from Talion's Messenger, which is one of the rares in the deck. And um, Talion the Kindly Lord is also pretty good, although not anywhere near as good as maybe some other creatures in standard for four mana. But still, in this deck, it works pretty well, especially if you've got a good idea of what your opponent is going to be casting, because you get to choose a number between one and ten. When they cast a spell with mana value, power, or toughness equal to that number, they lose two, li two life and you draw a card. So, depending on what deck your opponent's using, you might have a good idea of what they're going to be casting, and that might help you make the most out of Halion as well. And then you've got Roaming Throne, which is a really good card in any creature type deck, because you can basically choose fairies when it enters, and anything that triggers, any um, triggered abilities of the fairies will trigger an additional time, and that's things like the Ward on the Sleep Cursed Fairy will trigger twice. Halion's Messenger will draw a card and discard and add plus one counters more than once. And Talion will also make the opponent lose two life and you draw a card twice when they cast a spell that matches the number that you chose. And if you have Roaming thrown out before you cast a Spell Scorn Coven, then the opponent has to discard two cards, which is pretty good. And then if it's all getting too much, you can cast Fairy Slumber Party, which returns everything to uh, each other's hands, which can work pretty well when you have things like Adventures, because you get to cast those again, but doesn't necessarily work so well if you've built up lots of plus one counters on things. So it just depends. If you need it, then you can cast it, and it can help you regain balance, take control. But quite often, you might find you don't really need Fairy Slumber Party. And again, with the lands, we've got the four deserts. We've got the one Surveil land. Also, I should say one thing that really helps in the starter deck duels, if you're playing against other starter decks, and it's really useful to know what your opponent has. So in the Fairy Pranks deck, there's only one copy of Three Steps Ahead, two Spell Stutters, and then there are two Spell, spell Scorn Covens as well. So that means you know how many counter spells and which counter spells your opponent is likely to have. So you don't have to worry so much if you've already seen the spell stutters and the three steps ahead come out. You know that your spell is likely to resolve. So it's always good to be aware of what other cards your opponent's going to have when things like that come up. But let me know what you think of the fairy deck in the comments. This one does tend to be a little bit better than the previous ones. Then we have the outlaws deck. So this one does have some really good cards in it. But it's kind of like average in terms of performance at the moment. That's what it seems like. It does have some decent cards. So Tiny Bones, the Pickpocket, is a really good card that's pretty useful in standard as well. You've got things like Vile Smasher, which is going to be able to do extra damage to your opponent whenever an outlaw enters. And also, it's damage to a target opponent, so it does get to enable crimes as well. And crimes will be really important in this deck because Magda can create a treasure token whenever you commit a crime, and it triggers once per turn. So it can trigger on your turn and on your opponent's turn. So if you get to make three treasures, you can sacrifice them to make a 4-4 red dragon creature, which is pretty good. And if you have things like the Dead Eye Duelist out, then you can pay one and tap it to do one damage to target opponent, which is a crime, on your opponent's turn. So with Magda, you can make treasure on your turn. With Dead Eye Duelist, then Magda can also create treasure on your opponent's turn. And if you have these out, you're going to make lots of, uh, lots of dragons and get lots of advantage that way. Another good one is um, Vadmir New Blood, which gets to row each time you commit a crime. 
and can get to the point of having Menace and Lifelink, which is going to help you recover if your opponent's got a head start on you, or becomes a pretty good blocker if the opponent hasn't been quite so fast. You've also got Kervek the Punisher, which will enable you to cast black spells from your graveyard if you pay to life whenever you commit a crime. So it can help you get back things like murder or shoot the sheriff to help get rid of your opponent's creatures and bring those spells back, which is pretty useful. But it's not just the, you know, the removal spells, it's just any black card. So you can even bring back a tiny bones, you can bring back Admir, anything at all that's black or has at least one black on it, can't bring back the red things. Another one that you get lots of value from is Laughing Jasper Flint. It's a three mana, four, three that um, allows you or gives creatures you control but don't own the mercenary type, which means they are an outlaw, which means they'll trigger when they enter. Vile Smasher will trigger to do one damage because that's an outlaw entering the battlefield under your control. And the way you get these creatures is at the beginning of your upkeep, you can exile the top X cards from your opponent's library, but X is the number of outlaws you control. Jasper Flint is an outlaw itself, so you can do at least one. And then obviously the more creatures you have out, the more the X is going to be, so the more cards you get to look at. And then you can cast spells from among those cards as if mana were any color. So you can basically just copy your opponent's best things, which is really useful, and they become outlaws. So that's a great way of getting card advantage if the opponent can't remove Asper Flint, then you're going to get lots of extra creatures, hopefully, and lots of extra things from your opponent's deck. The only thing with this deck that's really annoying is that we don't have the deserts. We only have a surveil land, and then we just have basic lands. I guess if we had the deserts, maybe this one would be quite a lot stronger because you can enable crimes four extra times, potentially, throughout a game. I don't know if it'd be that game-breaking to let you have the deserts as well, but maybe because it works particularly well with these cards, they've decided to leave them out. It's a shame. It would be nice to see those in there. But let me know what you think of this deck in the comments. Then we have the black and white deck, Power to the People, which is one that, when you look at the cards, you might think isn't that effective, but it has some really good synergies, and it has a really, really useful board wipe. So the most important card in the deck, although you only have one of them, is Delny Streetwise Lookout, which enables creatures you control with power two or less to double their triggers. So things like the uh, Snarling Gorehound can surveil one twice when other creatures enter. Then you have things like the Iron Poor Aspirant, which can add a plus one counter twice onto a few different things. For Outlaw Medic, when it dies, you get to draw a card, but you do that twice. And the Deep Cavern Bat, which is one that you see a lot in Standard these days, gets to take two cards from the opponent rather than just one. And as well with the skull cap snail would exile two cards from the opponent's hand instead of just one. So there's lots of things you get. Obviously, there's other ones as well. Uh, Sanguine Evangelist gets battle cry whenever you attack, because this has power too. It will do battle cry and make all your other creatures get plus one, but twice, so they're all getting plus two. So it's a great way of getting lots of creatures out and then attacking with a very wide board to do lots of damage at the end. Because we have lots of small creatures, you might want to use things like Rankle's Prank which can help discard cards from the opponent if you haven't discarded enough with the Deep Cavern Bat and the Snail. But it can also make them maybe sacrifice two creatures. Maybe you have two things like four hounds you don't mind sacrificing. The opponent has a couple of big creatures. So that can be really good too. And we've also got the Wisp Drinker Vampire, which is a 2-4 flying creature that's four mana. When another creature, power two or less, enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life, so that helps you recover a bit. Also for 7 mana, which is pretty expensive, creatures with power 2 or less gain death touch and lifelink until end of turn. So again, if you have a very wide board, you might attack with lots of little things, and the opponent doesn't really want to block them because they have death touch, and the lifelink is going to help you bring your life total back up if you're getting a bit low. So there are some really good cards here. Now, what I really like about this deck is having lots of things out that are power 1 or 2, and then you cast Expel the Interlopers, where you choose a number between 0 and 10, destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. So if everything you have is power 1 or power 2, then you can choose 3, because it's all creatures with power greater than or equal to. You don't want to choose 2, because then you're going to lose all your 2 powered creatures. And you can destroy everything your opponents have that are big and leave just all your small creatures. So it's a really useful board wipe in this kind of deck. Again, we've got the four deserts. We've got the one surveil land. Actually, one of the slightly better performing decks as well. Maybe it has better synergies overall. You have things like ways to empty your hand pretty quickly because they're all quite small spells. And then with the Wojek Investigator, 
You can um, investigate each turn if your opponent has more cards in hand than you, which is probably quite likely. And then the removal isn't too bad either. You've got two copies of Make Your Move, which can destroy artifacts, enchantments, or creatures with power four or greater. Makeshift Binding to exile creatures. And you've got Consuming Ashes to exile creatures and also potentially Surveil 2, as well as having Expel the Interlopers, the board wipe as well. So there's a pretty good amount of removal there. And with the discard effects as well, you're going to really remove a lot of the things your opponent has, take the cards from their hand, and then just kill whatever they play. And you might be able to beat them on value. So it's a really fun deck to play. Let me know what you think of this one in the comments. The next one is the white and green mount or saddled um, deck. So we have some really cool cards here that work with saddling synergies. So for instance, we have Seraphic Steed, which is a pretty good two drop, two, two, first strike, lifelink. And if it's saddled, you get to create a 3-3 three, three white angel creature token when this attacks. Now it's not too bad to attack him with a 2-2 two, two first strike lifelink, because your opponent might not want to block it anyway. It does have saddle four, so you can't just saddle it with something like an ankle biter. Ideally, you're going to want something like Wily Duke, which has four power, and um, although you gain life and draw a card when it becomes tapped, it does have vigilance, so it won't tap when it attacks, but it will tap when it saddles something. So on turn two, you play the steed. On turn three, you play the duke, and you saddle the steed with the duke. You draw a card, you gain a life, and you get to make a 3-3 angel creature token as well. That's pretty good value to start with, although there are only one copy of each of these cards. The chance you're going to draw the ones you actually want not hugely likely. Another really good mount in the deck is Fortune Loyal Steed, which can um, saddle for one. So anything can saddle it, basically, and you can exile it and what up to one other creature that saddled it this turn and return them to the battlefield under your owner's control. So it's kind of like having Vigilance for one thing, but also helps with ETB effects that so you can attack and it's back to defend next turn. There aren't that many things you really want to saddle with Fortune and um, to bring back for the ETB effects. You have Outcaster Trailblazer that can give you an extra mana, which is, I guess, a bit useful if you have some small things you want to play. The best thing would be Gruff Triplets because you could exile the main Gruff Triplet. You've got two tokens that it creates when it enters and you can basically link the Gruff Triplets and make another two copies as well. So that would be really good. But again, there's only one copy of that in the deck. So the chance of drawing those things isn't amazing. But if you do have a Railway Brawler out, where your other creatures get X plus one counters on it equal to their power, so they basically double in power, then if you blink something like a Wily Duke, it's going to come back as an 8-6 with Vigilance, which didn't really cost you anything. So that's pretty good as well if you do have the Railway Brawler out, which is probably one of the best cards in this deck because it makes all your other cards a lot better. And then like the other decks, we've got the Four Deserts. We have the One Surveil Land as well. So let me know what you think in the comments about this one. It does seem to be one that is slightly better performing than lots of the other ones. But we will go through those stats in more detail after we've gone through the last of the decks. Let me know what you think of this one. Nine out of 10, we now have the um, red and blue spells deck. So this one relies on casting lots of instants and sorceries and gaining extra value from that. The best cards that help you um, with that would be things like Malcolm, the Eyes. Whenever you cast your second spell, you get to investigate. With Breaches, when you cast your second spell, you can flip a coin. And if you win, you get to copy a spell. And if you lose the flip, you get to deal damage equal to that mana value to any target, which is probably only going to be one or two. But still a little bit of extra damage just to ping the opponent or remove a small creature. You also have Crown Violent Cacophony, which can put plus one counters on itself and draw cards when you cast second spells. Johan Apprentice Sorcerer helps you cast extra things because you can look at the top card of your library and cast an instant or sorcery from the top according to normal rules. And when you have lots of things in the graveyard, you're going to get lots of value from Melic Reforged Researcher, a five mana star star where it's power and toughness are equal to twice the number of instants and sorcery cards in your graveyard. So if you've cast five other spells by the time you get Melek out, Melek's going to be a five mana 10-10, which also allows your instants and sorceries to cost three less to cast uh, if it's the first one your turn. Now, there aren't that many really big instants or sorceries you want to cast. In fact, there's only ill-timed explosion, seize the secrets, which can be discounted, and flick a coin where they're actually costing two generic mana to start with anyway. Otherwise, it's just a one mana discount on the spells over here, and obviously no discount 
on the one mana spells. Now Hell to Pay can be cheaper, which is pretty good. So Melek basically gives you an extra three damage with Hell to Pay, or an extra three treasure tokens if you didn't need the extra damage. So it's not terrible, but there's only really one card that works well with. Oh, and you've also got Slick Sequence as well, which gives you more synergies when you cast your second spell in a turn. So again, it can help you draw cards to keep your hand refilled. Also got things like Demand Answers that can also draw extra cards and seize the secrets, which is pretty good. So those are the best cards in this deck. We've got the four deserts. We've got the one um, fast land, not the surveil land for this one. But let me know what you think of this deck in the comments. It's kind of like average of the other ones. Maybe slightly ahead of average. But yeah, so this is one that's, um, that's doing okay. It's quite useful. Anyway, let me know what you think of this one. And then the last starter deck we're going to have a look at is Snack Time, the green and black food-based deck. Now this one does seem to be one of the most popular or the most effective ones, which is pretty nice. We've got some decent cards like Mosswood Dread Knight, Assassin's Trophy to remove pretty much anything. Greta Sweet Tooth Scourge is really good in food-based decks because it gets to create food and you have a couple of options of how to use that food, putting plus one counters on yourself or drawing cards for, and losing life at the same time. Got cards like Gumdrop Poisoner that can create food and be removal and life link all in one. And Sweet Tooth Witch that works really well with food because you can just keep pinging the opponent to make them lose two life. You're getting close to finishing them off. Also, the Huntsman's Redemption can make you a creature, but can also sacrifice something to search for a creature. So if you want to find something like a Scream Puff, then you can search for that using Huntsman's Redemption or the Wildwood Mentor, because that's pretty good as well. The best way to get some value out of this would be um, if you make the 3-3 three, three creature and then when it comes to chapter 2 you don't sacrifice the 3-3, three, three. you either sacrifice the Dread Knight because you can then cast the Adventure again to draw extra cards or sacrifice a Minstrosity to at least give you a food token so you get some extra value when it goes and you're left with the 3-3 three, three beast. That would be slightly better. One of the best cards in the deck is the Bristlebud Farmer. It's one of the new ones from the Big Score and it's a 4-mana 5-5 five, five Trample, which isn't terrible to start with, but it also creates two food tokens when it enters, which obviously works really well in this deck. And when it attacks, you can sacrifice a food to mill three cards and put a permanent from among them into your hand, so you can pretty much draw other decent creatures or land if you need it. And because you're putting cards in the graveyard, when you get to Lich Knight's Conquest, if you have this out, you can sacrifice any number of artifacts, enchantments, or tokens, and you'll probably have a few artifacts, and you can return that many creature cards from your graveyard to your battlefield. So if your opponent has killed big things like Bristlebud Farmer, the Provisions Merchant, which can be useful, or a Scream Puff, or the Gingerbread Hunter, what you might want to get back, Ditch Knight's Conquest can turn those food back into those creatures. That's a really good one, especially, well, even if you haven't lost creatures, even if they haven't been killed and Bristlebud Farmer just puts things into the graveyard, then you get a few things you might want to bring back. Now we don't get the deserts in this uh, deck, but we do get the surveil land. So it's a bit of a shame we don't have better mana fixing, especially when you have things like Assassin's Trophy, which are just green and black to cast. But it's not terrible. It still works pretty well. In fact, this is probably one of the best starter decks. We're going to have a look at the actual stats that some people have gathered. Let me know what you think of this one in the comments. Okay, so to go through some of the data that some people have gathered on the starter decks. If you want to know which ones are the most effective, if you're playing against other starter decks in the starter deck dual format, then have a look at this graph here. So this is the win percentage after 220 games. So this person's collected um, 220 games worth of data and just how often they've won using um, these decks. And you can see that on the left, the white and red deck is the lowest one with about 33% win rate against other starter decks. And on the right, the highest one is the black and green deck, which has about a 65-66% win rate compared to other starter decks. A lot of the other ones are just hovering around the middle with blue and white being a bit lower, black and red being a bit lower, and the white and black and the green and white being a little bit higher. Apart from that, all kind of hovering around 50%, which is kind of what you expect in a starter deck duel. So it might be that the green and black one just happens to be um, slightly better in terms of synergy and the way it works out. And we know the red and white one isn't built that well for the discover to actually discover things that are particularly useful all the time. Now it's important to remember this is only 220 games, which might sound like a lot, but that actually only means it's 22 games of each deck. And I've played some decent standard decks that can get 10 wins in a row and can get 10 losses in a row. 
and it's just down to the luck of the draw. So 220 games or 22 games each isn't really a very big sample size. So it might be that actually with larger sample sizes, this would actually average out a little bit more than it has at the moment. And some of the values might jump around. But let me know what you think of this in the comments. It's always really good to get some kind of data because a lot of people said the red and white deck was bad. But when I played it in the midweek magic event, I won three games out of three. And although it's not made very well, it seemed to be kind of effective. So with a small sample size, it's hard to tell. When you start getting data like this, you can actually have a conversation where you have something to back up what you're saying, which a lot of magic players these days seem to forget. You need to have some kind of data to back up your claims. Otherwise, it's just small sample size and confirmation bias. It's also kind of interesting to see this other graph here. Starter deck play rate by opponents. So the number of times the opponent played certain decks. So this one is going to be a lot more varied than the win rate because this is just based on what people think is good. And it seems like people really like the look of the blue and green ramp lands matter kind of deck and the red and green dinosaurs and the blue and black fairies. It's kind of interesting actually that the black and green deck is kind of low on that. It's actually the seventh most popular deck out of the 10. But again, relatively small sample size. So when you take a lot more games into account and give it a bit longer for the kind of meta to, um, to settle down a bit, then you might find these start to reflect the first graph of the win rates. Obviously, if people discover that one deck is better than the others, they're going to be more likely to play that one. But that's all we've got time for. I don't want to make this video go on any longer than that. So let me know what you think in the comments of the 10 new decks and this data that's been collected. And if you're relatively new at the game, it might be worth also saying that these decks work absolutely fine in the starter deck dual game. So you want to make sure you're actually in the starter deck dual game and selecting a deck from there. Otherwise, if you're going to take these to the standard play queue or the ranked queue, you're not going to do very well because these are just starter decks. They're not made to be very competitive in terms of standard or any other format. So don't take these to the standard queue unless you have literally nothing else. But even in that case, you could probably build a budget deck that would work better than these in the standard queue. But the starter deck duel is a really good way of being able to clear your daily tasks for the day. If you have to do green and blue spells and you don't have a green and blue deck, just play a few rounds of this and you're going to do pretty well at clearing that 500 or 750 gold daily task. And it's going to help you get there without having to invest in world cards just to get those tasks done. So that's all we have time for. Let me know in the comments if you have any other questions or anything else you need me to clarify. I will respond to the comments as much as possible. So thanks for watching this video to the end. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you found it useful. And I'll see you in the next video.